All right, welcome folks. So uh, the first talk that, that we're gonna dive into here as Mohit set this up is about our enterprise agents. So this is technology we've had for a while now. It's been deployed uh, in customer environments going on three to four years at this point. And it's providing an understanding of network topologies and performance in addition to some of the application level performance uh, from various points uh, around uh, a corporate environment. Um, what we'll discuss today is several new ways you can deploy this, which we think are really exciting and pretty groundbreaking, and then also um, several new features that we've baked in over the last few months, uh, which we also think are, are pretty exciting too. Uh, so uh, so some, some new features and capabilities that we've added to this uh, if you haven't looked at it in the last few years. So how can enterprise agents really be understood. The, you know, the, the first key point here is that you can understand um, the, uh, essentially the performance of branch-to-branch of -branch connectivity um, across your MPLS backbone, across uh, you know, a VPN, uh, or direct internet access. These things are gonna send traffic out on the ports and protocols, however uh, the traffic would flow normally. Uh, in addition to that, you can understand performance uh, to our cloud agents around the internet. So if you wanna be able to understand uh, performance of your uh, internet service providers and their peering connections, uh, you can actually see that as well. Uh, you can use these enterprise agents to also understand performance to external environments like AWS or Salesforce or Office 365 other services that might be in use in, in that environment. Um, and then lastly, as, as you'll notice here as well, uh, we bake in the concept of uh, application layer uh, performance in addition to the network connectivity and routing information we provide to help understand uh, the context of whether a performance issue is actually worth your time to troubleshoot or worth your time to look at because uh, there may be loss on the network that while uh, annoying, may actually not be uh, affecting service levels at all. Uh, so we'll take a look at that in the demo in just a moment of how all, all of that gets blended together. So that's kind of the concept of how these, um, you, you know, are deployed in various parts of the network. Now, how they're actually deployed, uh, this is where some of the new information comes in. So uh, traditionally, we've offered our enterprise agent as a virtual appliance or Linux package on a variety of distributions, um, and this is typically been the way that our customers would place this within uh, a branch office or their data center. Uh, based on some of the feedback and other things going on, uh, we've expanded that over the last year to make this easier uh, to place in locations that are uh, maybe a little bit more difficult to procure a VM or to run a Linux box. So the first is uh, Docker. So we supported Docker actually because of our, our own use cases. Um, the reality is we also run a bunch of cloud agents. Mohit was, was mentioning this around the internet in about 120 different data centers that we have to, to run uh, this software in and, and our ops team has to manage that. And that was becoming a, a, a difficult thing to do over time. And so by using Docker, we can uh, you know, essentially scale these cloud agents a lot more effectively, um, and we can also uh, tear them down when necessary. We can maintain them a lot more easily. Uh, and so this is now offered as well to our customers to deploy within their own environments. We've actually seen some significant uptake just in the last uh, four or five months since this has been available. Um, a surprising number of those Fortune 500 companies are actually using Docker to deploy operational tools uh, within their environment. Uh, so that's the first one, which we think is super exciting. The second one is based on uh, a need from several uh, of our customers to be able to deploy enterprise agents in places where there may be no IT infrastructure at all, no IT staff. This could be a small retail store, um, a part of the supply chain that does not have a server closet or anything else. And so um, this is effectively an Intel Nook uh, that uh, you can flash with, with a token on it that as soon as you plug it into the wall, uh, plug it in via Ethernet, you can actually uh, load it right up and it'll show up as an agent in your account. So you have your own account token that, that gets flashed into that image. Um, so that's a, another exciting one. And the last one here, probably um, uh, some of you might have seen this when, if, if you saw our booth at Cisco Live, we'll, we'll see a few demos here from Cisco Live, um, is on Cisco IOS. So Cisco IOS uh, started supporting what they call now, it's come, gone through a few different names, uh, virtual services containers back in 2013. And uh, these service containers are uh, separate 
virtual environments that, that run on the Linux x86 CPU and the, the control plane of the routers. Um, and uh, they've, they've put KVM-based virtualization on there, and you can actually run uh, uh, now virtual containers within those. Uh, starting uh, in December or January with uh, iOS XE 3.17 that you'll see here on the slide, they also open this up to external developers. So now folks other than Cisco can develop apps and place them on uh, Cisco hardware that, uh, that actually supports these virtual services containers. So we're one of the, the first folks out there that have developed uh, this capability to actually place an application uh, on a service container. And, um, and so this currently supports uh, ASR 1000 and ISR 4000 series uh, routers, which are the ones that actually have these containers built in. The basic idea there that they said is, we've got all the CPU capability uh, in here, we might as well put it to use. Um, you can run Wireshark, Snort, a bunch of other things that they've ported onto um, uh, these services containers, and you can also now run Thousand Nice Enterprise Agents as well. Um, the only requirement on it is uh, to, to run services containers, you need to have uh, a separate SSD that's actually uh, relatively inexpensive in, you know, in, in, in router pricing um, that you would, you would slot in there and uh, that would actually give you the, the hard disk to run off of. But the memory and, and CPU is uh, well within boundaries of, of performance that you would expect off of, off of these routers. And we'll see where this goes over time as Cisco rolls this functionality out to other devices. Um, so we'll see in our demo uh, some uh, ISR and ASR uh, enterprise-based uh, enterprise agents uh, in the demo. So this is a, you know, a view of the product. And what I wanted to talk through here is actually a demo we, we ran at Cisco Live, but I think it's instructive because it was running off of um, an ISR router we actually had in our booth and running off of an enterprise agent uh, you know, in, in the booth. So you actually will see the Cisco Live internet here um, as, as we dive into these capabilities. Um, so this is just to give you a quick tour of the product so I can set it up for uh, the rest of the folks later um, so you'll, you'll know all the concepts of how it works. So the first key concept here uh, within Thousand Eyes is there's a concept of layers. And uh, these layers, as I was saying, will go through uh, stuff like at layer seven here, like page load and web server metrics. Uh, so how long does it actually take to load the, in this case, ciscolive.com slash US site, which we were looking at from the Cisco Live floor. In addition to that, we can see network layers uh, and uh, a network topology, and then also routing information. So we'll click down through each of these. So in this example, uh, we're testing from several different locations um, around the US, in addition to uh, some places in Las Vegas, that's where Cisco Live was, and that's our ISR router there on the show floor that's showing up uh, in Las Vegas here. And we're actually seeing a, a three second uh, page load time for, for the Cisco Live site off of the show floor. So not, not terrible uh, in this case. So page load metrics, that's you know, super exciting. Let's move on to something a little bit more interesting and uh, take a look at some, some network stuff. So the first aspect is going to be understanding um, the web layer information. And so with the web layer information, uh, what we're actually going to see here is, um, is the ability to understand um, connection, DNS, other sorts of uh, challenges that might occur in, in accessing uh, this particular site at given time. So in this case, we're running a test every 15 minutes, but you can configure that interval uh, to however you want. One key concept here that you'll notice that our cloud and enterprise agents, the things that have been around for a while now, uh, run off periodically scheduled active tests. Um, what you'll see a little bit later with our endpoint agent will run a bit differently. So just to set that expectation up. And in this case, we can actually see that our friends in San Diego are, uh, you know, where Cisco Live was hosted last year, are unhappily unable to access uh, the Cisco Live site at this time. So if we jump down into our network topology view, we can actually see some of that information about how this is all working. So how we can understand what we call here a path visualization is on the left-hand side, these are our enterprise and cloud agents that we have located I'll highlight them first, I guess. Located here in San Diego, as well as in other locations, such as an ISR we have here on uh, the Cisco Live floor at the time. So this is from a month ago. As well as um, 
and ASR located in our San Francisco office. So Cogent is our primary internet service provider in our San Francisco office, as you'll notice there. And on the right-hand side, this is where Cisco Live dot com slash us is hosted in Rackspace. Um, in, in Rackspace, I believe uh, this is going to be one of their, uh, we can probably find out, I think it's their Washington data center there you can see. So it's in their Washington data center where uh, the, the peering connections are coming in for Rackspace. And if we expand this out, we can actually see what this network topology looks like in a little bit more detail. Um, the, the incoming connections here, the Rackspace network is here in green on the right-hand side. Our uh, local networks, so these are based on autonomous systems, are in the dark blue, and the peering and transit networks in between are this light blue color. So you can see as we move here from our San Francisco office, we move from Cogent in San Jose, and we peer with uh, Telia there in the Palo Alto Internet Exchange, so in one of the Internet Exchanges down here in Silicon Valley. You can also see right away that in our San Diego friends, the reason that they're unable to actually access uh, Cisco Live at this time is because, uh, unfortunately, Zio in, in Los Angeles and their Los Angeles pop is dropping 90, 91 of this sample, 91% of these packets that are flowing into the Rackspace environment in Washington, D.C. So um, that will uh, make any, any website not so uh, you know, useful. A couple of other things just to mention that are worth mentioning about what you'll see on here, we show context sensitive information depending on what's discovered. So you can see information such as failed path MTU discovery, which unsurprisingly has happened from San Diego. It's unable to actually determine the path MTU uh, in this case. Whereas if we look at our other agents like in Las Vegas, you'll actually see the path MTU sizes here. So you can understand path MTU problems, uh, TCP maximum segment size issues that might be mismatched uh, going across this network. In addition to that, we can also see things such as MPLS tunnels through this environment. So we would see right away that Zio, this is actually running through one of their MPLS tunnels in their Los Angeles pop. Uh, we can actually see the label information off of this too. Um, so the way, again, this is all done is instrumentation of these active sensors or probes here on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, there's no instrumentation here in this Rackspace environment. This is just hitting a publicly accessible web server that happens to be run by Cisco in a Rackspace environment. Um, so that's kind of the, the key concept of path visualization. And the last thing I'll mention is our route visualization view. We also then tie this together based on um, the prefix that's being advertised for this specific site. So in this case, it's a slash 20 in the Rackspace environment. And we can see on the routing plane as well how this would all look. So if I scroll down here, we can see this is Rackspace hosting, the origin autonomous system. We can see their upstream here, which is another one of their autonomous systems that they own. And if we expand this one level out, you can see their major peering providers, such as NTT America, AboveNet, so that's Zio, where we saw that, that trouble happening there in, uh, from San Diego as well as several others, level three, you'll notice on there, Telia, 12, 1299, a couple of different ones here. And so how, that's kind of how the often is that concept. refreshed? So the, uh, the network and application level views are user configurable, so you can set those to different timings. The BGP information we show in slices of 15 minutes, so you're gonna see change over time every 15 minutes, so you will see uh, effectively uh, route changes, reachability uh, changes in 15 minute intervals, and in this case, the routing layer is not changing at all. Uh, during this entire time. We'll see a few examples later today where you'll see route changes happening and we'll see what that looks like. Um, and you would see then how that is, is displayed here uh, as, as routes move. You would also expect if the routes move on this layer, we go back to the layer three information, you would expect to see routes moving on layer three as well then subsequently to the control plane changing. <laughs> All right, so that's just a, you know, a quick demo. Nothing super, super uh, crazy exciting there. Um, in terms of the data, let me zoom this one out again so we can see it a little bit better. So what we're gonna look at now is some functionality that we've added to uh, our enterprise agents that uh, include the ability to understand reverse path information. So 
forward path is, is very useful. It's what we've been doing for a long time, and a lot of our customers have appreciated this value. Uh, but the reality is, when moving across the internet and even parts of your wide area network, uh, there's asymmetric routing. Um, and uh, understanding loss and latency and other challenges uh, can be very difficult if you only have half the picture. So the idea with uh, reverse path information is that you can now actually see uh, both a forward and reverse path. So in this case, this is our Las Vegas ISR router again, sitting in our Cisco Live booth. Quest Communications, so CenturyLink is the uh, service provider uh, for uh, the Cisco Live show. And I'm just showing one data point here from Johannesburg in this particular uh, instance. And so what we can see on this view is actually a forward path going out um, in one direction through the Africa Internet Exchange, like you might expect from Johannesburg, going up to Amsterdam's level three pop, heading across the pond to New York City and peering with Quest, and then moving across the country um, in the Quest network, this is in Denver, um, and moving across the country into, uh, into Las Vegas. But if we actually look at the opposite direction, we see something completely different. So this is the Quest network again in green. We see an exit point here. This is Sunnyvale. This is how they demarcate their network. SVL is Sunnyvale. And there's also one here in Highland Ranch, Denver. Um, and so as it exits Las Vegas, there's actually two interesting paths here that we see. So we see that uh, some traffic back to South Africa is flowing through the NTT network, going around NTT through New York, from Seattle to New York to London. It's going to then peer with Dimension Data and some of their providers and IS Internet Solutions, into, which is a South Africa internet provider. You can see in this case, we'll actually see there's a routing loop there. I can reduce the number of hops here so we can see a few things. Um, and, uh, and what we'll see is actually high latency links, high levels of loss. We'll also see information here where we actually have um, a completely different path flowing through level three, not through NTT. So actually, not only are there different providers going in each direction, in this case, there's actually different providers even going in the same direction, which is uh, not something we actually commonly see. Um, and so the key thing to understand here is as there are problems with loss and latency in this network, you can actually understand individual links and how they're all impacting this. And rather than having just round trip times, you can actually have one-way latency and loss times. You can have one-way throughput information, and you can individually uh, understand interface and link level uh, problems as it moves. Uh, so some pretty school, cool stuff. Um, in addition to that, I'll, I'll mention one other thing. That, so I looked through this last night trying to figure out what was going on. So if we go to the route visualization, I'll actually explain uh, what's happening here. Um, let me move up. Actually, let's go back. Let's go back here. One moment, this will be easier. Since we have so many different points here that we're monitoring with BGP, the easiest thing, if we look at uh, Johannesburg, is if we hover over this, we can actually see the BGP view here. So we want to look at that slash 17 prefix that's representing, um, that's representing South Africa. We want to understand this reverse path first, be able to see that. We take a look at that, we click it. It'll take us to the route visualization and the correct prefix. Uh, the reality is, is that there's a lot of prefixes in here, so rather than me having to remember it all, uh, it'll help. Um, I'll let it load here for a second on our very speedy hotel Wi-Fi, which you'll see a demo very soon about exactly how speedy it is, which is going to be very exciting. Um, and what we'll see here in the, in the route visualization is actually an understanding of how this performance is, is working. Um, and so uh, the key concept here at the top is there's a set of prefixes we're monitoring. So in this case, with the reverse uh, path, what we call agent-to-agent -agent tests, we're actually monitoring all of the prefixes of both the targets and sources. And so the one here that we care about is this slash 17, which is representing our Johannesburg agent uh, in, the, in the Hertzner network. And if we go down, we'll see there's Hertzner. That's our South Africa autonomous system we're trying to access. That's how we're trying to get back to South Africa there. Um, we can actually do some interesting things in this visualization. I can expand the hops here a little bit. We can also search for, let's see if it's in this level. We can search for Quest. So Quest is where we're trying to come from. That's, that's Las Vegas. We can highlight it. We can actually see Quest there. So I'll leave that highlighted. Um, 
And if we look at this autonomous system information, we can actually see Quest right here. Let's just show one of these, so only this monitor. I'm just going to show one of the Quest monitors. One of the Quest monitors from San Jose is going through NTT America and this IS Solutions Network, exactly what we saw in the Layer 3 view. Interestingly enough, if I deselect that and show all the monitors again, we go back, the other monitor that's in Quest, Washington, D.C., we show that, it's going a completely different way. It has a different routing table. Going through level three into the Africa Internet Exchange. So actually, even on the Quest network, there's multiple routing tables, it looks like, in play here um, that are being used to direct traffic. And that's why we saw two different layer three paths going from the same pair of autonomous systems, which is a pretty interesting view here. So what you can see here is obviously the, the routing information both in the forward path and the reverse path in addition to the layer three information and understand those changes over time. So as this uh, ch you know, moves over time with uh, various uh, BGP updates, you would then see this uh, update on, on the layer three view. So some cool stuff here that we think is gonna help folks really understand um, what's going on in both their own wide area uh, environments as well as uh, their, the internet links that can be difficult for them to understand exactly what's happening with performance. So a typical way folks might do this would be place uh, uh, an enterprise agent at their data center edge in a DMZ, be able to monitor back to a set of our cloud agents around the internet and be able to understand then performance to various points, various networks across the internet uh, if you want to stand, understand uh, internet peering here. So some, some cool stuff there. All right, that is the majority of what I have. Um, I will pull back up this presentation and just wrap it up here with a quick summary and then hand it off to the next team. <coughs> okay, so hopefully your screen is in the right place now. Um, so, so what does this mean? Uh, you can now really visualize the entire network path between any two points that you've deployed uh, these enterprise agents as well as our cloud agents that we deploy for you. Um, and you can understand forward and reverse path information. You can uh, measure and locate the changes in loss and latency. I didn't show it here, but you can actually see DSCP remarkings that move through the network as well, in addition to just the same way that we saw the MPLS label information. Uh, and we also added the capability to uh, run this test using UDP and not just TCP. So if you have voice over IP uh, in your environment, you can uh, run this using UDP as well, uh, which we think is super exciting. Do you run the test only between your agents? Or routers in between hops by hop you are doing some running some tests so how do you measure the one way latency you know this is some sure so in the case of these agent what we're calling agent agent tests here i guess it kind of reveals exactly how it's deployed um, it's running between two agents so to be able to actually uh, understand latency and loss uh, and throughput in each single direction. Uh, these are running between agents. Um, unlike the first example that I showed you where it was a, what we call an agent to server test, you can run it to any publicly accessible server uh, you know, on the internet. Uh, in this case, you would run it between two agents. So you could run it between agents in your environment or uh, agents in your environment and one of our agents we maintain called cloud agents. For each of the hops in between where we're getting that data, uh, we're essentially doing TCP-based path tracing, uh, or in this case, UDP-based path tracing, depending on which one you set up, uh, to be able to understand all of that information and that data is being shipped back to us um, in ICMP response information. We're combining that with the routing table data and geolocation information and a bunch of other things. 